we're not supposed to be in a marathon here. We're supposed to be uh, dealing with the rest principle. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that we, uh, tonight, we'll get you out of here by 8.30. All right, continuing to look at the process and the progress, it takes two things to become a Christian. Now again, we're not just here to share these things with each other. Hopefully we're learning things that we can share with other people out there to make it clear to them more quickly. God gave us this object lesson. It's the greatest object lesson that was ever given to the human race. It cannot be improved upon. It's so simple, and yet it's all there. So the two elements that are required to become a Christian are what? The blood and the water. The remedy for the past and the provision for the present life. Okay. The life of Jesus Christ. Okay, the person then is living in grace, the five pillars here, they are living by faith, by trusting God in this place. The people never went in this place, only the high priest. So our high priest went there first uh, in, uh, at, at his ascension. And by the way, that can, comes by very quickly. There are people today that don't believe he went there. They believe he went someplace else. Now please keep the sequence. It's going this way. Okay? There's no jumping back and forth. The sequence goes this way. It's very important that we hold on to that. The table of showbread is on the north side. Who is the king of the north? God is the king of the north. Psalm 48, verse 2. Okay. The counterfeit king of the north, of course, is Satan. And Satan generally attacks from the north to prove that's who he is, is the king of the north. Well, if God is the God of the north, the only thing that's on the north side, the only object that's on the north side in the sanctuary is the table of showbread. So if we were going to put his throne any place, where would it be? On the north. When Jesus went to heaven, he went to the throne of God. Now, we were all taught that the throne of God is in the most holy place. Well, it goes there at a point in history but that's not where it was when Jesus went back to heaven <laughs> the throne of God is the table of showbread that table in the Hebrew the bread is called the bread of the presence right presence of who the father himself the bread of the face the bread of the face of God Jesus went to the father Now, if that's the throne, somebody in the Bible should have said it. Psalm 23, verse 5. <laughs> now, if a person is living here and the enemy is coming from the north, what does the enemy have to get through to get to the person? table of showbread or the throne of God it has to get through God himself okay, it's a pretty safe place right Psalm 23 verse 5 thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies all of God's people have known this through history now, obviously, the Jewish people didn't recognize a lot of this. I said all of God's people. They called them the Sedekim, the righteous ones in the midst of Israel. They understood these things. The sanctuary taught them the true plan of salvation. So they could see parts of this, but they didn't. There was one element they really... The father is here at the table of showbread. The son comes in and presents himself to him. Now, I need to read that in the Mount of Blessings, page 71, because we always want to see the three witnesses. Uh, oops. I need the book. Mount of Blessings, page 71. 
says the Father's presence encircled Christ and nothing uh, befell him but that which infinite love permitted for the blessing of the world. So here is Jesus and here is the Father. Okay? The Father's presence encircled Christ. Here was his source of comfort and so it is for us. He who is imbued with the Spirit of Christ abides in Christ. So now let's change the, the person in here. This is now the person and they are in Christ. Okay. The blow that is aimed at him falls upon the Savior who surrounds him with his presence. So the blow is coming from the north here, okay. It strikes Jesus who surrounds him with his presence. Whatever comes to him, this person, it gets through, whatever comes to him comes from Christ. He has no need to resist evil for Christ is his defense. Nothing can touch him except by our Lord's permission. And all things that are permitted work together for good to them that love God. So earlier as uh, Bill mentioned you know, the devil made me do it? No, there's none of that. That's right. <laughs> and neither did the devil get to me. Only Christ is the factor in the Christian life. So once we internalize this, and the sanctuary teaches it, the Bible teaches it. The Spirit of Prophecy teaches it. <laughs> he does nothing in partnership with the devil. That's right. Christ is in control in the Christian life. And nothing can touch that life except it comes through him. And if it comes through him, then the Christian is to accept it as coming from him. That's the ultimate responsibility. And the question I always have to ask about here is, what does that do for complaining? <laughs> That's why Paul talks the way he does. He lived in this process. He says, for me to live is Christ. That's how a Christian talks, by the way. For me to live is to go to Yosemite on a vacation. No. <laughs> For me to live is to uh, get a couple thousand dollars in the bank so I, I feel safe. No. For me to live is Christ. And so nothing matters on this planet then. And a person who is dead is now living. For me to live is Christ. And whatever comes to that life now can only be a blessing. Job has been mentioned. Did his life look like a blessing? <laughs> he had some moments where he had to ask himself some questions, didn't he? Even his wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? Yeah. Didn't matter where he turned, the big lie was being supported. That God gives you freedom of choice unless you choose against him. No, God supports freedom of choice when we choose against him too. And God trusted Job. That's the part of the story that really gets to me. 
God trusted him. He said, Satan, you can throw anything you want at him. He's going to be okay. <laughs> Would you like to know that tonight God trusts you like that and me? <coughs> that he could say to the universe, it's okay. You can throw anything you want at I trust them. Yeah. That's where this thing is going. See? He has to be able to say that <coughs> to the universe about each one of us. I'm going to lay myself on the line. You want to know who I am? Look at my daughter. Look at my son. That's the issue here. And that's why we need the time to make the preparation. But we must know that's where he had us, has us headed. That kind of responsibility. There are many, many glorious things waiting for us, yes. And when Peter said, Lord, I gave up everything for you. What am I going to get? <laughs> What did Peter give up? <laughs> a boat that needed patching up. <laughs> a net that was torn, maybe. Little house over there in Capernaum. He said, I gave up everything for you, Lord. <laughs> but Jesus didn't rebuke him, did he? <laughs> he said, well, Peter, you're going to get a hundredfold. <laughs> Yes, the reward is going to be glorious, but you know, none of us really are going to have that as our motivation when this is all done. <laughs> no. It's very pretty right now when we can catch glimpses, and it's great. God allows us to see it. He wants us to see it. <coughs> Little pieces here and there. But what is the definition of heaven? Seven A. I never bring my seven A for some reason. The definition of heaven. It's the last page on seven A. It says the definition of heaven is <laughs> thank you, the presence of Christ. The presence of Christ. And so we don't have to wait to go any place. The definition of heaven is the presence of Christ. Where two or three are gathered in my name, we have that one down. Let's do one more. Let's define a Christian now. It's not somebody who goes to church on Saturday <laughs> or knows that people are really dead. It's not somebody who believes Jesus came, died, resurrected, high priest, he's coming again, all those things. That's not the definition of a Christian. There's only one definition in the Bible. It's a consistent definition, never changes, just one. And the easiest way we can look at it is uh, Colossians 1.27. He says it plain out. It's the mystery to everybody who does not have the experience. But the mystery has been revealed and they know once they have the experience. He says, this is the mystery. Gentiles can't get into this until they convert. The mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So if anybody ever asks you what a Christian is, don't fill them with a bunch of information. Just tell them what it is. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And the word glory always means character. So we have the hope of becoming like him. So if Christ is in you, Let's, let's uh, compress what we've been do going through so far. If Christ is in you, how has he always lived? What quality of life did he live on this earth? Sinless. That's right. Absolutely sinless. Does he ever change? Okay. So if he's going to live in me, how's he going to live? Same way. Will he participate with me? in known sin. It's an utter impossibility. He has never learned about sin in his experience, in his life, choosing it. 
he's not going to learn it inside of me okay. so he's going to continue to live the way he always has the issue in the plan of salvation is not is he going to be like me but am I going to be like him and so if he's not going to live in a person who commits known willful sin great controversy page 472 the desire for an easy religion that requires no striving no self-denial no divorce from the follies of the world has made the doctrine of faith and faith only a popular doctrine but what saith the word of God says the Apostle James what doth it profit my brethren though man say he have faith and have not works can faith save him now most of us in this room have that very clear in our mind now don't we but the rest of the world out there still thinks that faith is what's going to save them there is a great deal that we need to be saying to people out there Yes, and on very basic levels. This is about as basic as you can get. This is the word everybody uses, faith. It's a good word. <laughs> it's a very essential word. But it's not going to get anybody into heaven by itself. The other one that is thrown at us is, well, God loves unconditionally. Well, that's true. <laughs> He does love unconditionally. But he's not going to take anyone into heaven because he loves them. There has to be a reciprocity involved here. There's got to be a response. There's got to be a love relationship involved here. And it takes two to do that. Love has to come both ways before it accomplishes something. So this statement holds. Can faith save him? Obviously by faith alone can't. Okay, continuing. The testimony of the word of God is against this ensnaring doctrine of faith without works. Let none deceive themselves with the belief that they can become holy while willfully violating one of God's requirements. There it is. The word willfully, known. And, you know, it's been there all the time. For 6,000 years, we've been listening to the one story of how it all started. How many did it take for Adam and Eve? Just one. That's all it takes today. And Satan has been telling us a lie from day one. Well, yeah... What makes you think you can do better? That's his lie. Our heart calling, page 45, Satan throws out the taunt. Adam and Eve failed in a perfect earth. Angels failed in a perfect heaven. Moses, the lawgiver, failed. That's what Satan says. But he's leaving out a whole bunch. He tries to focus it on that, and he left out a whole bunch. Daniel. Joseph. And the list, you know, you can make that. In Luke, the uh, first chapter, verse 6, it says, Zechariah and Elizabeth. <laughs> oh there's a big list that Satan left out <laughs> but you know that lie is there and it's supported by everybody on this earth who's not a Christian you can't do it and they always add nobody can and we have to decide it for eternity who we're going to believe 
And we have to talk like that all the time when we're around people. We can't let them get one little clue that we don't believe what God says. Not for one instant. Next sentence. The commission of a known sin silences the witnessing power of the Spirit and separates the soul from God. I said that sentence to one of the biggest names in Adventism that teaches righteousness by faith. And this was not well received. One sentence destroys the whole concept. And there are hundreds, and that's what I told this individual. I said, could you please give me a scripture that says what you believe? A scripture. I got back an opinion. I said, no, I didn't ask for an opinion. Please give me a scripture. It agitated the person and they said, well, what difference would it make if I gave you, uh, you know, dozens of scriptures? I said, well, I'll tell you what. I can give you 400 for what I believe right now in the Bible. And if you want 400 in the spirit prophecy, I can do that too. He said, well, if I could give you 500 for what I believe, what would that prove? He just wasn't catching it. I said, you know, I didn't ask you for 500. I asked for one, just one, please. It never came. You know, we must be tactful as we can through the Spirit with people. We must be loving, yes. But we can't let them walk over the truth of God. We must speak the Word. Next sentence. Sin is the transgression of the law. I need to draw a little picture here about now. <laughs> that's all of the creation. Everything God ever made, that's it, in that circle. And everything has its part. And there are no holes. There's a place for everything. You know, whatever the shape of it, there's, just fill it all in. And Lucifer had his, uh, his place in here, close to the throne of God. There are no empty spaces here. Everything's there. This is creation. And Lucifer decided he wanted a different spot. Well, this is all full. I mean, there are no spots. God made everything where it's supposed to be, the way it's supposed to be. So when Lucifer decides he doesn't want that spot, where can he go? <laughs> yeah. And what's out there? The opposite of creation. We have other words. Death. Annihilation. Non-existence. That's what Satan said when he said, I want to be somewhere other than where you put me. I want annihilation. I want death. I want non-existence. I want to be uncreated. You see how dumb that is? That's what sin is. This is life. This is organization. This is order. Sin is everything that's not there. So anyone that chooses sin over creation, there's only one other place to go. And when a person understands the issues, isn't it kind of strange that anyone would want to go back to that idea? of sin we can see how bent the mind has become through the sin problem we've got to leave it all behind and live in God's creation we're supposed to be the creationists 
par excellence on this whole planet. Did you know that? <laughs> That's who we're supposed to be. <laughs> we're supposed to be able to deal with the creation subject on all the levels that God has revealed to us. And so the state of the dead is not that you go out. The state of the dead is you're not part of the creation anymore. And that's a strange thing to opt for, to want, to desire, especially in a person who professes to be a Christian. So these should not be strange statements on any level, and when we say them to people, they must sense that, that there's nothing strange about this statement, the commission of a known sin. Yeah. It breaks the covenant relationship. You're not part of God's creation anymore when you do that. This is why Ellen White tells us there is no excuse for sinning and she's talking about known sin, willful sin. There's no excuse for it. Let's look at that. Desire of Ages 311. Now, what I'm talking about now and sharing with you is the uh, holy place experience. That's all we're talking about. There are things that don't happen in the holy place experience and known sin is not one of those. It's, it doesn't happen in the holy place. In Desire of Ages 3.11, we probably uh, can quote this one from memory. God's ideal for his children is higher than the highest thought can reach. Sure. Uh, then it says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. This command is a promise. And if we're living in the holy place, we know it's a promise. There's nothing about it that says, oh, I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to do that. No, it's a promise. <laughs> and who has promised? Yes. Okay, uh, let's draw that. Uh, this is a Christian, and there is a growth process. Okay, that's right. Coming this way, progress, continual advancement. Uh, I don't know what, what uh, this particular individual said in the sermon beyond that, but uh, let's tighten it down here a little bit. <laughs> Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered. Is that right? Okay. How much sinning did he do in that process? He proved that sinning is not necessary to the process of growth, of learning obedience through suffering. He proved it. Okay? So that's the first thing we want to see about this growth process. There is not one moment where it's essential that we do one known sin. It's not in there. Now, it is true, and we're going to cover this in a session coming up, that uh, Christians make mistakes. Okay? We're aware of that. We know that we can make mistakes. But there's one line we must not cross. A mistake is never a known sin. Mistakes are something that happen through ignorance, unaware, unintentional, unpremeditated, through strain from the path, through unwatchfulness and things like that. Yes, Moses was surprised. That's right. He did not plan to do that. So as we uh, discuss certain elements of growth and development and all that, then they're all important. We must never make an excuse for known sin because God will not accept it. He never has in all history. He's not going to start with me. <laughs> okay. Now on this page... 
It says the plan of redemption contemplates our complete recovery from the power of Satan. How much? Where does it happen? Right here when a person is born again. We don't grow up into this one. The power of Satan is broken when the life of Jesus comes in. Mount of Blessings, page 2, says that when Jesus comes in, he first cleanses the soul temple to make it a fit habitation for the Spirit. It says that over in 1 John someplace, doesn't it? If we confess, He's righteous, just <coughs> to forgive us from how much unrighteousness? And to cleanse us from how much? Faithful. Yeah, he's faithful, that's right. Now, this cleansing from all unrighteousness happens here, not down the road. The all unrighteousness is everything we are aware of. Everything we know about our life, he takes care of that. The character defects we don't understand yet, that still has to be dealt with as we become aware. That's the growth process. Christians are not learning how to overcome sin. That's not what Christians do. Christians are learning how to develop a character. They're learning how to be like Christ. But it is a fatal mistake to think that this process is learning how to overcome sin the sin problem that's not what's happening here we're going to have to read several statements uh, to verify that but they're there next sentence he came no I missed a sentence Christ always separates the contrite soul from sin that's the next sentence. I'm not inventing any sentences. I'm just reading the book. Now here's the word. There's no psychology in this word. There's no sociology in this word. There's no evolution in this word. It's an absolute word. And it says God, Christ always separates the contrite soul. There's a condition there. See? The contrite soul from sin he always does that next sentence he came to destroy the works of the devil and he has made provision that the Holy Spirit shall be imparted to every repentant soul to keep him from sinning Amen. and these sentences just keep rolling by in these books they're there over and over and over. Review and Herald, March 10th, 1904. He who does not have sufficient faith in Christ to believe that he can keep him from sinning does not have the faith that will give him an entrance into the kingdom of God. That's another one-liner that empties off the bookshelves. <laughs> You know, we were told the books of a new order would be written. We've got them. They're everywhere. Any book that doesn't say this is a book of the new order. <laughs> you know what we should do with those kinds of books? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> we, we need to seriously consider what we're carrying around in our bookshelves. That's right. Mine is boiling down very rapidly to the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy. I keep some books for reference just to show how bad books can get. But that's all they're there for. Yeah. No, the truth is in here in the Bible. Uh, down, continuing on that page. The tempter's agency is not to be accounted an excuse for one wrong act. Satan is jubilant when he hears the professed followers of Christ making excuses for their deformity of character. It makes Satan happy to hear that? Isn't that a strange picture? 
Christians making Satan happy? It is these excuses that lead to sin. Yeah, if I say, you know, I really am trying. I want to be an overcomer. And I know it's possible to become perfect someday. But I know I'm going to do it next week. What's going to happen? I'm going to do it. Because I believe in sin. That's right. When a person talks that way, they believe in sin. They don't believe in righteousness. Hard things, but we better look at them. There is no excuse for sinning. A holy temper. A holy temper? Why'd she pick that one out? <laughs> a holy temper, a Christ-like life, is accessible to every repenting, believing child of God. As the Son of Man was perfect in his life, so his followers are to be perfect in their life. Jesus was in all things made like unto his brethren. And we're going to talk about who those brethren are later. He became flesh even as we are. He was hungry and thirsty and weary. He was sustained by food and refreshed by sleep. He shared the lot of man. Yet he was the blameless son of God. He was God in the flesh. His character is to be ours in the judgment there's one standard that will be waiting as we approach that day it's not ten commandments it's not a code it's not laws it is the character of God that's the standard of judgment now that's awesome The character of God himself is the standard of life in the earth made new. Is that too high? It's what he said he wants us to become and he's made every provision for us to do it. Nothing has been left out. So as we approach that day and it's coming sooner than most of us probably even think about again don't get time into this just know the preparation time is behind us now we better get busy with this God said be ready be ready be ready as we're, our approach is coming here check up your language each one of us we have to do it every day what am I saying what words come out of me do I say, someday? Do I give the impression, someday? Yeah, we need to check up on ourselves. No, it's right now. It's, it's right now. And our language has to come forth to people that they know. This person has settled into something. They're not saying, oh, if I blow it over here, I can get it confessed and start up again, no problem. No, that's making provision for the flesh. We've been told not to do that. Do not make provision for the flesh. It's today to decide if Jesus uh, sees fit for me to have my work finished today, it's okay. No problem. That's not assurance in me. <laughs> it's just knowing whom I have trusted and he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him. And he can keep me from falling because I know it, see? This is why we need to talk to people. I know. I know. I'm not experimenting with it. Yeah. He is able to keep... I have tested him. I have proved him. And he has never failed me. You see, people are not going to be won by the arguments now or the documentation. It's the conviction that's going to touch them. They're going to know they're standing in front of somebody that isn't bending for some reason. 
There will be people converted not because of you said something, but the way you said it. And it's going to come very rapidly. As the sunbeam, I'm on page 313. As the sunbeam imparts to the flowers their varied and delicate tints, so does God impart to the soul the beauty of his own character. Now, we have the sun. No, I keep moving things. We have the sun out here. And we had a little flower right there, okay? What is the sun doing to that flower? Oh, it's not painting it? <laughs> uh, is the sun uh, making that a sun? Is a piece of the sun going into that flower? No? None of those things are happening. But that seems to be the story we, we're trying to tell people about impartation. That's not what God is saying. And that's not what the sanctuary is teaching. Let's read this sentence again. It's not hard to understand this sentence if we just keep it with flowers, but we've got to get it over to us. As the sunbeam imparts to the flowers its varied and delicate tints. Where's the tint? Did it come from the sun? No. There's something there in the flower that when the sun and the flower get together the flower does what flowers do. The color comes. But it's the flower that has the color, not the sun. This might not come so easy. Let's see. <laughs> the last part of the sentence. So does God impart to the soul the beauty of his own character. I don't get his character. He imparts the loveliness of his character. There it is. It's shed all over me. And I become like him. But it's my character. Let's make the shift now so we hold on to the language. I'm not going to go to heaven because Jesus is righteous. If I ever get there, it will be because I have become righteous also. And I get there through the impartation of all his righteousness. I have no excuse because he just showers me with it. So I can't have any mistake about what real character is all about. That's right. In spite of the fact that we understand a lot of the truth through the sanctuary, every now and then a word comes out here and a word comes out there. Oh, Jesus does it all. Well, he does it all in terms of merit, yes. But don't stop there. Yes, he supplies all the merit, all the power, all the strength. But I must become. what heaven is populated with righteous beings and nobody's going to have to hold me up in heaven to keep me righteous because I am righteous yeah we've had it drummed into us so hard and so heavy there's none righteous all my righteousness filthy rags we have all those down we've got to stop talking that way about Christians Christians are growing and developing and becoming 
like Adam was before he fell and then it takes one more step after that. We're not joining the race of Adam before he fell. We're joining the family of the Godhead through Jesus, our elder brother. We are not to become like Adam before the fall, ultimately. We are to become like Jesus Christ himself. And he takes us into his family. Yes, we must be sealed in that character before the rest of the test comes. Yeah, we're going to be tested some more after we're sealed. There are more things that must happen to us, but the first step of the final moments there is to at least be like Adam before he fell. I was once, I almost mentioned the name. I don't do that in meetings. It almost came out of me. I was talking to an individual <laughs> who uh, believes a whole different way. And he said to me, my view of perfection is much higher than your view of perfection. I said, really? What is your view? He said, my view of perfection is that it is so high we will never reach it. <laughs> and I just looked at him in utter disbelief. But you know, that's what he teaches in this world. That we can never do it because it's so high no one can ever do it. I just looked at him after a while and I said, what good is it? <laughs> what good is it? All right, our time is up. Tomorrow morning, uh, we're going to read the statements, clear statements, Spirit Prophecy says, how a Christian lives all the time without any fluctuation. And once we've understood that clearly, then we have to do the next step and understand what a mistake is. That's right. We don't want to put ourselves in a place where we're going to get discouraged over something. We must know clearly the difference between known sin and a mistake. What an error is what a bad judgment is, those kinds of things. And we'll look at that through the Bible and the spirit of prophecy uh, probably at the end of that session.